Good morning, church family. It's so good to be here, and God is so good. So very, very good. It's just, uh, if you're visiting with us this morning, we are so glad you're here. We're so glad that you're here. I'd encourage you after the service to just go out to our welcome desk out in the front lobby there. And uh, there are some, inf you can receive some information about our church, and you can receive, we'd like to know a little bit about you. You will also receive some free gifts. So. Scattered around the sanctuary, there are connect cards. The purpose for the connect card is that we connect. So if you're, new to, if you're new to the church, we'd just really appreciate it if you just fill that out. Give us your name, your number, your email address. Tell us a little bit more about you so we can get in touch. And if you're not new to MBC but you have prayer concerns or anything like that, the Connect card is the way to get them onto the prayer list for our prayer team. So I'd encourage you to do that as well. One of the things that distinguishes MBC is... Uh, what we used to call making room for God. It's an opportunity for uh, anyone in the, that worships with us regularly, if they feel that they have a word from the Lord for the congregation, you're uh, invited to come up, see me. I'm sitting over here on the, uh, I guess on your left. And uh, just come and see me and tell me a little bit about what, uh, what you feel the Lord's laid on your heart and we can discern whether it's for this morning or not. There's a microphone up here and Sunday after Sunday, we're repeatedly blessed by those words that our congregation brings before us. So I'd encourage you to do that this morning. Don't be shy. Don't be afraid. If God's laid it on your heart, we need and we want to hear it. With that, would you just join me in prayer as we just return to our worship? Father, we come before you and we magnify your name because you are good. You are good to us. We're gathered here this morning solely because, Lord, you are good. You have called us and you've redeemed us through your son, Jesus Christ. And we just want to offer up our praise to you this morning. Amen. Yes, Christ be magnified. You may be seated. I'm going to just uh, invite uh, Hugh and Jake to come forward. And there's a video to be played. And they have a, a special announcement. Good morning. Um, if you don't know who I am, I'm uh, Hugh. I'm the worship and creative director here at NBC. And so we did this campaign uh, last year just to highlight different ministries, different volunteer opportunities. And so Jake and I are going to be talking about worship and media. I'll start off with worship. We have uh, amazing opportunities to serve um, at NBC, not just on stage, um, but also in the back. So if you love God, and you love music, and God has given you the gift of musicianship, uh, we would love to have you. We are always looking for musicians. Um, but if, uh, if music, music is not your thing, um, we also have our stage teams, our production teams, um, projection, sound, uh, and all those different capacities. So if you're technically interested in how all this stuff works on a Sunday, we'd love to have you. Join our teams. Uh, we're always looking for volunteers. And then we also have a choir. So if you don't like singing by yourself, a solo, or maybe a, little, um, a few people on stage, we also have a choir that is uh, led by Abigail. And there's no experience needed. If you just want to learn to sing or be a better singer, honestly, she will make you better. And it's a great way to just enter into uh, maybe worship ministry later on. So those are some amazing opportunities uh, we'd love to highlight. We'd love to have you. God's given you guys all amazing talents. You're not here on a Sunday just to sit here on a Sunday, but to serve God and serve in the church. So this is one of those opportunities. Here, Jake. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name's Jake. Um, I work with you on all our media work as well. Um, all my volunteer positions are a little more behind the scenes, behind the camera. So if you don't feel like being up here on all the lights, uh, we have a plenty of uh, places for you to fit as well. Uh, so for the media team opportunities, we have several that involve cameras. We have some that involve our Sunday live stream services as well. So if you ever have a Sunday where you're on vacation or you're sick and you listen to it on Spotify or watch it on YouTube, that's kind of what my teams do. Uh, if you ever see any of our photos of great events on social media, things like that, that's what we do as well. Um, so you don't need to be a professional photographer by any means. We all have 
cameras for you. You don't have to be uh, providing your own equipment or anything like that. Uh, but if that interests you as well, uh, those are primarily what we do. Like I said, the Sunday streaming service and the photography teams are big uh, on what we're running there. So plenty of opportunities for you guys to help out there this uh, fall. Great, thank you guys. Thanks, Hugh and Jake. There's a whole lot of work that goes on behind the scenes and it all requires people to serve and people to use their gifts. And we'd encourage you to do that. The more we join in, the more glory we can bring to our God. So thank you for that. Would you just join me? I'm going to uh, just do a prayer for today's offering. And, uh, Father, we come before you, Lord, and we acknowledge that we are blessed. We are blessed in more ways than we can count. And we pray, Father, that as we send around the offering plate this morning, that you would receive these tithes and offerings as our praise to you, further praise, Lord, to the, for all the great things that you have done for us. We ask, Lord, that you would just bless the use of this, uh, these funds for the furtherance of your kingdom. And we ask also, Lord, for good discernment and wisdom in terms of how to, how to employ these financial resources. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, welcome once again. My name is Roy Sieben. I'm one of the uh, leaders here at MBC, and it's, uh, again, uh, my honor to welcome you, and particularly anyone who's visiting here today. So you are, we are really happy to see you. We have tonight, final call. Tonight, there is a newcomer's dessert night. And it's at the home of Jim and Mary DeMars. So if you've been attending for a little while and you'd like to get to know a little bit more about us, I'd encourage you to come on out. It's at, i got to look at the notes here, 6.30 tonight. 7. It's here at 7. It's at their home at 7 p.m. tonight. And I'd encourage you to go. They always have great desserts and uh, great whatever you guys put on is always good. So uh, you can register for it at M at MiltonBibleChurch.ca, and you can get the address and all that information from the website. So I'd encourage you to do that. The uh, open choir preliminary session has been moved. It's been moved to Wednesday, October, August the 21st at 6.30, not October, August the 21st at 6.30. So again, as Hugh just mentioned, if you're interested in joining the choir, you want to learn to sing like Abigail does, Come on out. It's guaranteed. It's guaranteed. So, um, but you know what? It is a wonderful thing to gather to praise the Lord. So I'd encourage you to do that. Wednesday, August the 21st at 6.30. And then there's a uh, special stage team training event happening on Wednesday, September the 4th at 6 o'clock right here at NBC. And it's an opportunity for anyone that's interested in getting involved with the sound and the stage team, everything that goes on here on Sunday mornings. Uh, this is your opportunity to come on and get some in-depth training. So I'd encourage you to do that. It's on Wednesday, September the 4th at 6 p.m. And you can register for that at miltonbiblechurch.ca slash worship. So I'd encourage you to do that. We need, we need your assistance. And finally, I think it's time to release the kids to their program. So would you just join me in prayer? Father, we thank you for our children. They are a great blessing. And we have a responsibility, Lord, to instruct them about you, about what Jesus has done for us. We have a responsibility to train up the next generation, Lord, as, a, as your church family. We ask, Father, that your Holy Spirit would go be with their teachers. Would you just uh, protect everyone? Would you encourage everyone? Would you just build them all up as they participate in the kids' program this morning? We ask this in Jesus' name. We thank you. So kids, you're released. Away you go. And with that, uh, it's my, uh, my privilege to uh, introduce our guest speaker this morning. I think she's well known to most of us. Uh, and I'm going to invite Tori Cochran to come up to share the word with us today. Good morning, Milton Bible Church. Like Roy said, my name is Tori Cochran, and I'm usually on a Sunday morning running around with all the kiddos. Um, but today I have the much, much simpler task of speaking with you all. And I have to tell you, I've really been enjoying this series. Often in the summertime, you'll miss a message. I know cottages are calling your name. 
But thankfully, we have YouTube and Spotify, and I have been catching up, and it has been so refreshing to see examples of Jesus encounters in Scripture. And my hope today is that I can walk you through a section of Scripture that you may not have thought specifically as an encounter with Jesus passage. Today, we're going to look at Jesus' first miracle. It was so great to hear Heather talk about a miracle this morning. When Jesus was at a wedding in Cana, and he turned water into wine. And I just presented this passage as the first miracle, and that's usually what it's known for. But today, I hope you'll see that there are four different encounters with Jesus in this 11-verse passage. And when preparing for today, I had the pleasure of getting to reflect on mine and Nathan's wedding. We've been married for two years now. I know we're still babies. And uh, our wedding was so much fun. Really, the vision for our wedding was having so many people that we love in one place at one time, just having a great time together. We had things like food trucks and lawn games and lots of dancing and candy everywhere and an unforeseen highlight of some hula hoops. If you've been to a wedding, there's usually a game of sorts where the guests have to come forward and do something to get the bride and groom to kiss. And it used to be clinking glasses, but in my opinion, that's way too easy, and I wanted my guests to put themselves out there. So our guests had to come forward and do five loops on a hula hoop to get Nathan and I to kiss. And we had people do it successfully. Some people have a hidden talent for hula hooping. They would come up and hula hoop for like three minutes and they would jump and they would dance and you could tell they had practiced as as kids and probably as adults as well. Um, But there was an unforeseen highlight in all of my careful planning for our wedding and that was a group of gentlemen that came forward, five gentlemen to be exact, and you can actually probably see them around this room this morning, considering three of them are on staff at the church. (laughs) Hi, Jim, Matt, and Mark. Um, And these five men decided that they couldn't do five loops themselves, so they came forward and did one each. And well, my photographer knew this was an incredible moment, so the number of photos I have of these men giving it their all to do one loop on a hula hoop is amazing. And I'm going to save those photos for a rainy day, but gentlemen, please note, I did send them along to your wives after our wedding. And our wedding day was filled with moments like this. Moments that were just joy and pure sunshine. But it also had some challenging moments. Like when Nathan and I had just been announced as husband and wife and we're running out of our ceremony and the shoes that I pick have gems and they catch on my big poofy dress and I completely rip it as I'm running down the aisle. I'm sorry, Dad. Um, I could tell stories about our wedding for hours. And it was only one day in our lives. In our lives. The wedding we're going to look at today lasted for multiple days. And a wedding was the most important event of all events. It was the most significant, important, and carefully planned event in a family's life. And weddings would last up to seven days. And there was a betrothal period of a year before. And the husband had to prepare for his marriage. He had to cover all the costs of the wedding. He had to prepare his home that they would live in. He had to show that he had work. Then and only then when he had proven that he could provide for his wife would there be a celebration. So it lasted a very long time. And the bridegroom would take this year to show he was ready to care for his bride. So as we're going to read about today, when the wine runs out, it's telling society that he's not ready to provide for his bride. On that note, let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for today, Lord. I thank you that we can come before you, God, and just dive into your word. I pray that you've prepared hearts um, for what they're going to hear, Lord, that it's your words and not mine. I just ask that you can bless our time together. In your name, amen. Before we get into the passage, I'm a context-obsessed individual, so let's look at some context to give some more depth into our reading. Today we're going to look at John chapter 2 verses 1 to 11 if you want to open to that in your Bible. And if you don't have a Bible at home, we have a table at the back that has some Bibles and they're free for you to take home with you. It's our gift to you. But we're going to look at chapter 2 this morning. But before chapter 2, we have chapter 1. And chapter 1 is really a standalone chapter in the Gospel of John. It's a verbal testimony that Jesus the Messiah was coming. It is 
At this point in time, many people thought that John the Baptist was the Messiah, but he is saying, no, the Lamb of God is coming to take away the sins of the world. And this is where we get introduced to our first disciples, Andrew, Simon, Philip, and Nathaniel. We see their first encounters with Jesus and them choosing to follow him, which leads us to the wedding that we're going to look at today. But before that, I'll give you an overview of the layout of the book of John. In chapters 2 to 12, we, has, we have Jesus' public ministry. We see him healing people and feeding thousands. He walks on water. He teaches openly in the temple. He claims to be the son of God, and it ends with him predicting his own death. And then in chapters 13 through 17 are Jesus' private ministry with his disciples. We, it starts with him washing their feet. We see Jesus predict Peter's denial. We see Jesus in prayer, and we see him speaking about the Holy Spirit. And then finally, in chapters 18 through 21, we have Jesus' death, resurrection, and post-resurrection appearances. Our passage today marks the moment that Jesus begins his public ministry. It gets the ball rolling for the greatest day in human history. And the story is significant because it marks the moment that Jesus is moving from his 30 years in private life in Nazareth into his public ministry, which will make him known forever. The moment is done at a wedding in Cana in front of his family and friends. In verses 1 to 2, it says, On the third day, a wedding took place at Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there, and Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. The moment that ch marked the change from private life to public ministry was a miracle with his family and friends. His family and friends are the first to truly see that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, whose wedding was this? We are not sure whose wedding it is. However, it says that the wedding is in Cana, and Cana was 12.8 kilometers northeast of Nazareth, Jesus' hometown. It was a small farming town, so those in Cana would have to travel to Nazareth, the big city, to get supplies throughout the year. This meant that the few dozen who lived in Cana knew the about 500 who lived in Nazareth quite well. And that's how Jesus was invited to the wedding. So, Let's read about this wedding in John chapter 2, verses 3 to 11. It says, When the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied, My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washing, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. And the master of banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. When G what Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glories, and his disciples believed in him. I've highlighted four different names in this story, and that's because we're going to look at four different encounters in the passage. We're going to look at Mary and her familiar encounter with Jesus, then the servants, a disinterested encounter with Jesus, Third, the master of the banquet, an unknown encounter with Jesus. And finally, the disciples, a life-changing encounter with Jesus. So let's begin with Mary in verses 3 to 5, which say, When the Bible was gone, when, sorry, not when the Bible was gone, the Bible's never gone. When the water was gone, water, no, again, when the wine was gone, Jesus' mother said to him, They have no more wine. Woman, why do you involve me? Jesus replied. My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Running out of wine was a social catastrophe at the wedding. There's actually some evidence that suggests that the groom would be open to lawsuit from the aggrieved relatives of the bride. Like I said earlier, weddings would last up to seven days, and throughout the seven days, more and more guests would come. The guest number would increase with each day. So they're really running out of wine, and the social impact has also grown as well. More people are at the wedding to know that the bridegroom was not prepared for his wedding, which means he was not prepared to take care of his bride. Mary knew what was going on, and this means many people at the wedding probably knew what was going on. The newlywed couple was headed towards complete outcast. So Mary does what Mary knows to do. 
Think about it. Whenever Mary had a problem, who would she have gone to? Probably the one who knew all things. Jesus never had a bad idea. Mary knew fully who Jesus was. She knew who her son was, and Mary was going to Jesus to tell him that there was a problem that needs solving. She knows that Jesus is loving and compassionate towards people, so who else should she have gone to? Mary is going to the person she knows to go to in every situation and predicament. And I need to pause and look at this word woman in Jesus' response for a moment, because let's be honest, if we referred to our mothers as women, we'd probably meet the Lord really quickly. We read it as disrespectful, but that's not the case in biblical context. Jesus also refers to the Samaritan woman and Mary Magdalene in this way, and he even uses woman when referring to his mother from the cross when he's making loving provisions for her care after his death. This is in no way implying a lack of respect or affection for his mother. I have heard that perhaps this was Jesus' indication to Mary that his role as her son was now second. He has been in private life growing up to this point, but now he was entering into his public ministry. He was no longer her son first, but Jesus the Messiah was his primary role in life. And this is important to understand when Jesus says to Mary, my time has not yet come, yet does the miracle Anyways, Jesus was informing his mother that he was acting on God's timeline, not hers. He was, sa- he was going to save the day, but not because she was telling him to do so. This is the only time in the New Testament when Mary requests something of Jesus. So we can see that she receives this message. He is doing what God has sent him to do. His time on the cross was to come, and she got to witness the perfect plans come to life. We also get to see that in her response to the servants when she says, do whatever he tells you. Mary comes to Jesus with her request and leaves it in his hands entirely. What a good lesson. Present your request to God, but know that he knows far more than you ever will. Present your request and then leave it in his hands. If you are a believer, if you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, this is a familiar encounter we need to have with our Heavenly Father. Mary goes to Jesus because that is her gut reaction. Mary has compassion and empathy for this newlywed couple who's on the brink of disaster. She is coming to Jesus for the sake of another. What a beautiful picture. When she sees someone heading towards ridicule, she goes to the Lord for help. Is this your response? Is your gut reaction to go to Christ first? What do you need to change in your life to make this your first reaction? How will you make this a familiar encounter in your life? How will you run like Mary to Jesus? Next, we have the servants, a disinterested encounter. Verses 6 to 8 say, Nearby stood six stone water jars, the kind used by the Jews for ceremonial washings, each holding from 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the banquet. They did so. Before continuing in this section of scripture, it's really important to give context to the word of servant. Servant in Greek means, is the Greek word for diakonosis, which bear with me, I didn't actually take Greek, but I do love it and I read about it often. So if I mispronounce that, my bad. And it really means one who exalts the commands one who executes the commands of another, or more simply, one who serves. Examples when you look up the word are deacons in a church, or a waiter, or a servant of a king. When the Bible uses the word servant, it is one who is voluntarily choosing to serve. So, there are a few interesting parts to this passage. The first for me is the stone water jars that were nearby. These jars were meant for rituals, not sanitation, and they were made of stone because it was believed that the stone was less likely to to contract ritual uncleanliness. Now, we can read the jar information as a simple fact. Scripture brings pictures to life with details like this, but it can also be looked at more deeply. Perhaps it's more than just a simple fact. Perhaps it's telling us that the jars that were being used for Mosaic law were now replaced with the new mezzanistic provision of Jesus. Something as small as jars filled with water can look different with the light of Christ. Next, the waters were filled to the brim. And these jars were, could fill, a, it says 20 to 30 gallons, which is about 80 to 120 liters. That's a lot of liquid. 
I'm an avid water drinker. I have a water bottle with me everywhere, and I have a one-gallon water bottle, and every time I use it, people stop me to ask me about it. This is a lot of water, and that is an incredible amount of wine. That's so much wine that when Doug Tuji, who's leading our worship this morning, heard that this was the passage that I was speaking about today, he had to send me along a fun fact. And now Doug was jealous that he isn't preaching this morning to share about the topic and share his fun fact, so I figured it was required of me to share Doug's fun fact. Now this is Doug's fact, not mine. So it said that there was six stone water jars filled with around 20 to 30 gallons or 80 to 120 liters of water. Did you know that there's an actual measurement that Vintners, which is a person who sells or makes wine, there's an actual measurement used that's called a buttload. Any guess of how much a buttload is? It is 126 gallons. So Jesus literally makes a buttload of wine. Thank you for your fun fact, Doug. <laughs> so these jars were filled to the brim. So no one could say that Jesus just added wine to the top. Every single detail is thought out because during this time, wine was actually mixed with water. So they would mix three parts water to one part wine. They essentially watered down their wine. Jesus knows that doubt will creep into people's minds and he covered every single detail. And third, the servants serve with incredible obedience. Mary told them to do as whatever Jesus says, and whatever Jesus says, they do. They fill the jars to the brim, they draw out the liquid, and they bring it to the master of the banquet. The servants are disinterested parties. They are not influenced by considerations of personal advantage. They are not personally gaining from Jesus turning water into wine. If anything, they have a lot to lose. Imagine they do exactly what Jesus says and they draw out the water and they bring, from the ceremonial washing jars and they bring it to the master of banquet and it's just water. Not only are the bridegroom at risk of being socially outcast, but the servants are risking embarrassment by bringing water to the master of the banquet. We see implicit faith in Jesus here. They're going to bear witness to a miracle even though they're not there in their minds to bear witness to his miracle. They are disinterested parties who get to testify of what happened on this day. Jesus used them to accomplish the glorious miracle that started his public ministry. And the servant showed incredible obedience without knowing all that would come. Jesus is working constantly. And when we let him use us for his plans, we get to bear witness to his incredible power. We get to testify about what the Lord has done in our lives but also those around us when we ask God to use us for his kingdom growth. We see the importance of serving with obedience in the servant's disinterested encounter with Jesus this day. Next, we have the master of the banquet, an unknown encounter that we can read about in verses 9 through 10, which say, And the master of the banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine. He did not realize where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. Then he called the bridegroom aside and said, everyone brings out the choice wine first and then the cheaper wine after the guests have had too much to drink. But you have saved the best till now. The master of the banquet had two roles mainly. First, he was the server at the wedding, the head server at the wedding, and second, he was the master of ceremonies. His primary role was to make sure the groom had provided enough food and drink for guests. So get into his mindset for a moment. He knows the trouble the bridegroom is facing right now. He probably actually is the first one to know that they are risking running out of wine. He's probably, he probably knows more than the bridegroom does about the social impact that is about to happen. If he has any type of empathy or compassion, he is probably panicking right now. But even personally, he is not doing what his job was. His primary role is to make sure there's enough food and drink for guests and there is not enough drink for guests. Most of us have had moments like this in our lives. Definitely not this exact moment. If you have, please let me know. Um, but the feeling that you are not delivering on what you're supposed to be. Personally, my heart drops into my stomach in moments like this. And I often find this feeling in myself when I'm acting out of my own works instead of inviting God into what I'm doing. 
letting myself make all the decisions instead of letting God lead in whatever I'm doing. And something interesting about me is that I can tell you exactly how I feel in any given moment. You can talk about a story and I can tell you exactly how I felt, but tell me a feeling and come up with a story and my brain goes blank. But God is funny and I really wanted an example for you guys this morning of me working out of my own strength instead of working out of God's. And so I laughed when I did it again this week. Um, So I had an illustration to share with you all. And as I mentioned before, I'm always running around with your kids. I'm in charge of children's ministry here at the church. And if you ask any children ministry person, the hardest part about kids ministry is finding people, the perfect people to put in a room with the kids. And during the school year, it can be hard, but people have more of a schedule. During the summertime, it is a lot harder to find people. And I was looking, I'm a very administrative person, so I've planned long in advance, but then these next two weeks, I'm looking at it and I'm going, I only have a couple people. I really need to fill spots. And I don't just wanna fill spots, I want the perfect people in the room to be with these kids. And so I am messaging people, and I kid you not, I messaged probably about 10 people, and none of them were available. And that I totally understand. This, that's not the point of the illustration. Um, they were unavailable. And I was messaging um, with my husband, Nathan, and I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. I don't know what I'm going to do. My heart went to my stomach. I had that feeling. I don't, like, the kids need their own program. I know they need people. We need people. You know what? I'm going to take a mental break, and I'm going to come back. And then during my mental break, I honestly just went, God, you know the right people. You know the right people. You know who, are going, who is going to be in that room. Lord, just bring me the right people. And I kid you not, I messaged one person, and they said, yep, I'm in. And then I messaged another person, and they said, yep, no problem, count me in. To the point that I had 15 people in a row who had said yes. And not only that, I had people who had previously said, I can't do it, come back and say, actually, I moved things around, I'll be there. And that's what happens when you give it to God instead of doing things in your own strength. My heart went from my stomach back into the right place. Now, let's go back to the passage. And this passage is worded very specifically. If you're reading it for the first time, it says that the master of banquet tasted the water that had been turned into wine, and this isn't weird or because it was water that had been turned into wine. The master of the ceremonies had to taste the wine before it went out. Like I said before, it was a mixture, so they had to make sure that the mixture was acceptable. And I love that we can read this passage with a pause. The master of the banquet drinks the wine, not knowing where it's come from, though the servants knew, and he calls the bridegroom aside, and we can be on the edge of our seats. Is it good? Is it bad? Imagine being the bridegroom here. He is at his wedding, and he is getting pulled aside by the head of the service team. That is not usually a good thing. And then he says, everyone brings out the choice wine first, and then the cheaper wine when the guests have had too much to drink but you have saved the best till now. The relief in that moment would have been incredible. The guests are going to continue to have a great time. The whispers of running out of wine would be done. Not only that, it was delicious wine, the best wine of the wedding, and the fear of the social impact is done. But automatically, the master of the banquet gives credit to the bridegroom. Remember, scripture tells us he didn't know where to come from, and it's natural to assume the bridegroom did not as well. How many of us do this? How many of us do you think have had an encounter like this? God doing something behind the scenes, but then we give credit to everyone else except to God. What would the kingdom here on earth look like if we acted as if God was at work in people's lives before they knew it? Because that is in fact what's happening. This summer, I've had the privilege of doing some discipleship development with our interns, Sarah and Naomi, and we've been reading Practicing the Way by John Mark Comer, and it's incredible read about how to apprentice under Jesus. It looks at how he lived for how we're meant to live, and in his section titled Goal Number Three, Do As He Did, he has a paragraph that I'm convinced I will never forget. It says, We often start with the assumption that because someone isn't a disciple of Jesus, God isn't at work in their life. But what if we started with the opposite assumption, that God is all present and full of love and drawn to sinners, that he is likely already at work in their life, gently inviting them in. 
In this paradigm, our job is to just look for signs of the ever-present God, and when we see them, and we will, join in. Followers of Jesus are called to find where God is already working and join him. When we meet someone who doesn't know the Lord personally, what if we framed our minds like this? If we walk into relationship knowing that they are having unknown encounters with our Lord and Savior. We don't know what happened in the life of the master of the banquet. We don't know if someone, he turned towards Jesus because someone followed up with him and told him all that had happened with Jesus. Regardless, we know that God was at work in his life before he ever knew it. The master of the banquet had an unknown encounter with Jesus at this wedding. And finally, we have the disciples, a life-changing encounter. In verse 11, it says, What Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. The disciples had an encounter and believed in him. That is a life-changing encounter for Andrew, Simon, Philip, and Nathaniel. These men bore witness to the miracle of Jesus turning water into wine. They had been called to be disciples just before this wedding. They were newly acquainted with Jesus, but they get to see his glory shown in two ways. First, in his ability to perform the miracle, and second, in his grace in providing abundantly in quantity and in quality. Let's look at the life of Andrew for a moment. Andrew and his brother were fishing on the coast of the Sea of Galilee when Jesus saw them walking on the shore and told them to come and follow him and he will make them fishers of men. He is known for being the first follower of Jesus. He is known for his missionary travels after Jesus was crucified, where he preached in the regions around the Mediterranean area. Andrew was one of the first to be involved in an evangelical effort that extended beyond the Jewish people. Now let's look at Simon who is Andrew's brother and came to be known as Peter. He was one of the first followers of Jesus and was part of his inner circle. He was an outspoken disciple, one of Jesus' closest friends, an apostle and a pillar of the church. But for all of his strengths, Peter had several failings in his life. Still the Lord who chose him continued to mold him to exactly who he intended Peter to be. It was Peter who first confessed Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God. He spoke on the day of Pentecost when the church grew by 3,000 new believers. He performed healings and preached boldly for the Lord. He was an example of having fear but continuing forward as well as learning from our mistakes. Philip. Philip had been a disciple of John the Baptist. And for me, Philip feels like a disciple who grew up knowing Jesus even though he didn't really know Jesus yet. He meets Jesus and immediately says that he found the one that Moses wrote about in the law, the one that the prophets also wrote about, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. And when Jesus calls him to be a disciple, his first reaction is to go and tell Nathaniel, so he too believes. We see Philip taking Gentiles to be introduced to Jesus. And the last time the Bible mentions Philip was when he was there with people who were gathered in Jerusalem to pray after the Lord's ascension. I see Philip as a steady source that introduced Jesus to all of those he met with. And finally, we have Nathaniel, who is also known as Bartholomew. One of my favorite parts about Nathaniel's story is that he starts as a critic. He hears that Jesus is from Nazareth and says, Nazareth, can anything good come from there? Despite his skepticism, he follows Philip and meets Jesus. And when Jesus meets Nathaniel, he knows his character and mentioned a story that makes Nathaniel immediately say, he is the son of God. He saw the risen Lord and was present at ascension. Nathaniel shows us that Jesus knows our hearts so deeply that we change our lives to follow him. Look at the lives that came from the disciples. This small moment led to that. They were invited by Jesus and bore witness to his glory. And scripture says when Jesus, what Jesus did here in Cana of Galilee was the first of the signs through which he revealed his glories and his disciples believed in him. Their witnessing this miracle of Jesus made them believe. Perhaps it was the first time they believed, or perhaps it made their belief in him grow deeper. Either way, it says they saw his glory and they believed in him. You have all borne witness to this miracle now. That's why we have scripture. It is the living word of God. You have heard of this incredible encounter. Will you believe in Jesus? Will your belief in Jesus grow deeper? Is this a moment that sparks a life a life-changing encounter with our Lord and Savior. I'm going to invite the band up as I close. 
These are my challenges for you this morning. That you prioritize Jesus to the point that the gut instinct of running like Mary to him is a familiar encounter for you. That you have obedience like the servants. That even when you have a disinterested encounter, kingdom work happens. That you walk in your life knowing that God is at work having unknown encounters with those who don't believe in him yet. And that if you haven't accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, today you have bore witness to his first miracle like the disciples. And my prayer is that you make that decision today to have a life-changing encounter. I invite you to stand as we close in worship. We will sing. We will sing of the goodness of God. Tori, thank you for your word today. Jesus changes everything. He changes hearts of stone to hearts of flesh. And he can change circumstances. He can change everything about your life if you choose him to. I'd encourage you this morning that if you want to have that touch from Jesus, if you'd like to have an encounter with Jesus, come forward with the prayer teams on either side of the service. and Just uh, bring yourself forward. Just come on, pray with them. If you have a need, you have a concern, you have a worry, bring it to Jesus. He changes everything. So I'd encourage you to just come forward this morning and do that. Would you just join me in prayer as we close the service? Father, we come before you, Lord, because you are the giver of all good things. You have given us Christ, our Lord, our Savior, the Christ who changes everything. Be with us this week as we go forward and allow us to just move in your power and your spirit and your presence. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week, everyone. I just encourage you to continue the worship by going out and having some fellowship in the lobby area and leave this room a little quiet just for prayer time. Thank you. Have a great week.